Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome Jim Newton, um, the author of a book on Jerry Brown, uh, A Man of Tomorrow. And we're going to uh, go into that in just a second. But first, I'd like to also welcome our online audience. Uh, these are our online programs from the Commonwealth Club. We're being done virtually without audiences, as uh, expected in the COVID crisis. And uh, we have done over 70 of these in the last two months. Um, they're all available on our website, www.commonwealthclub.org. And uh, they're at your, uh, at your leisure, at your, whenever you would like to see. We have a lot of them on the crisis itself, but we also have uh, our, some of our other usual programs on various issues of interest to Californians and to everyone in the world. This one is actually uh, very, very focused on a nice California subject, someone who has had a, a national stage for a long time um, uh, because he ran for president as well. It's about the youngest governor in California's history and the oldest governor in California's history, really quite a combination, something only Governor Jerry Brown probably would have tried and succeeded at. Um, so first of all, welcome again, Jim. Thank you very, very much for talking to us this way. And I thought uh, because of the crisis that we would start with something that's in your book, uh, which I found a, a fascinating parallel. Uh, you mentioned that the John Birch Society uh, long ago was against fluoridation, uh, thinking that it would cause some serious problem uh, if we engaged in that. And, and then you compared it to some other things that, that were going on um, later in Jerry's thing. And, and right now, if we talk about COVID-19, there is a, there's a group of people who, who believe that, that the uh, pandemic is a plandemic um, and, and that the, somehow the vaccine is going to turn us all into the digital slaves of Bill Gates, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's very interesting. One of the things that's interesting about history is to show that although the content changes uh, over decades and over time, that there's always different groups in society that, that, that come at the process, not too differently, uh, in this case, the conspiracy theory, um, and, and how governors have to deal with it. So how, how did Governor Brown, at the time Governor Brown, deal with the, the uh, John Birch Society? Did he... Yeah, well, this whole, whole first of all, let me say thank you. Uh, thank you for yep. hosting this. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Uh, and thank you for your interest in the book. Um, uh, yeah, the certain notion of denialism, uh, which the Birch Society had a, was a stripe of climate change has a version of that. Certainly the COVID crisis has a version of that. Um, you know, there's a moment in the book uh, where uh, the, it's in the after, Jerry, Jerry Brown had been elected governor. Uh, the, he was preceded by Ronald Reagan uh, in his first term as governor, um, his first terms as governor. And the, 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 those who wanted to fluoridate water really believed that this was an opportunity, that finally Reagan, who had had support from the Birch Society, was gone. This was the opportunity to now move forward with what most people, I think, at that era and certainly later regarded as a fairly common sense uh, health program. Um, uh, Brown uh, did not deliver uh, the way they expected that him. Mm -hmm. He's, among other things, an extremely skeptical person. Um, and he put them through a lot of questioning and said, you know what? His his response was to say, well, wait a minute, you've got a problem here. You've got a problem with tooth decay or um, mm -hmm. you know, the problems that go with not fluoridating water. Why isn't your answer to get your children to brush their teeth rather than <laughs> putting a new chemical in the water supply? And I think they were very flummoxed uh, by it. They had a quick <laughs> and reception, uh, and he came at it from this wholly different point of view. In fact, it wasn't until Pete Wilson was governor many years later that California finally, on a statewide basis, fluoridated its water. Um, so, you know, Jerry Brown can be uh, surprising. Uh, he does not play by orthodoxy. He does not accept readily conventional wisdom. Um, now, that said, he is also very much guided by science and scientific mm. theory. And I think you really see that in his environmental protection, his ideas about environmental protection, going back to when he was a very young person and up through the present with climate change. Um, so in that sense, uh, while he's a, he's a skeptical person, he asks a lot of questions, he likes to not be told uh, what what the consensus is. He likes to explore those underlying questions. In the end, he's not a denialist. He's not a, a person who questions the fundamentals of science. He's very right. much guided by them. Uh, and as I said, particularly with respect to climate change, you really see that. And you saw that in the face of a lot of denialism. There are, there is sadly a segment of the American people that does not believe that climate change is real or that it is uh, that human beings are responsible. And Brown, particularly in his third and fourth terms, had to, had to deal with that pretty forcefully. Uh, 
Well, I thought it was a, an excellent, first of all, political biography, but it must have been very different because you talked all about the ideas that informed his viewpoint, as opposed to the political ideology that informed his viewpoint. He's a politician who has a set of ideas, and it's an unusual combination of ideas that he, he put together. It's not ir irrational, it's quite coherent, but it's still very unusual. Um, and and, and I, I thought that was really an excellent part of the biography was was to, to, to cover this. So one of the things he said, he lives by two, two sayings. So you can, you can go into that because I think that that's excellent. Yeah, well, right. He had, there's a number of uh, ideas that he has summarized in sort of short, uh, the pithy maxims um, that have guided him a lot. Do what you are doing. Um, the notion um, that uh, that one should be immersed uh, in one's work uh, and uh, captivated by it and understand its connection to larger things. Uh, there are other notions uh, that come out of Zen, out of the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, Buddhist traditions, the Jesuit traditions. Um, you know, uh, another uh, principle that he likes to talk about is to live in the inquiry, um, mm -hmm. to really constantly be questioning. Um, and and th that idea that the questioning itself is part of the mission. So it's not really always about achieving the answer. It is the asking and the reformulating of the question uh, that I think is sometimes most important. Yeah. Um, it is worth noting, as I, and I hope it's worth noting because I noted in the book, that uh, doing what you're doing and living in the inquiry are somewhat at odds with each other. One, it implies a certain kind of acceptance uh, of, of, you know, principles and, and subservience and notions that there are higher truths that one has to be, come to grips with. The other is to question uh, some of those principles. So unsurprisingly, uh, two maxims that helped guide Jerry Brown's life tended some turn out to be somewhat at odds. And that tension between them, I think, also helps to define. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because just do what you're doing it can end up being fatalistic. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry is totally not fatalistic person. Um, and, and living in the inquiry is something that makes it impossible to be fatalistic. So uh, while the one saying could tend you towards fatalism, he clearly did not go there because of the other things that were in his life. Um, I, that's right. He's, he has a, sometimes a, a sort of a dark streak. Uh, I mean, in the sense that he is humor, <laughs> humor and also a willingness, uh, almost a desire, I think, to point out to people that things are not necessarily as good as they seem. Um, mm -hmm. He's... Uh, this certainly comes out when he talks about nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear war. Um, that just because the Soviet Union has fallen, that does not give Jerry Brown the sense that the threat of, of a nuclear accident or even of nuclear annihilation has disappeared. To the contrary, he's very much um, in tune with, with, with nervousness about that. Mm -hmm. But that's different, I think, than fatalism. I think you're right to draw a distinction there. There's a, a, a bracing a willingness to confront difficulty but wrapped around a kind of uh, uh, perseverance and determination to move forward and to address problems. Yeah, we'll get back to the nuclear issue because that's something he's he's even working on now, and it's a it's a very interesting part. And I especially want to talk about how he feels about Putin and and, and the Soviet Union. But I think we'll we'll say that for near the end. Let's okay. let's kind of follow his life a little bit now that we we uh, laid it out here. Um, one of the first things that you talk about that I thought was interesting was he was only about 19 years old and the whole Carol Chessman uh, death penalty issue that his father had to face, how he faced it, the Jerry gave him advice, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that was a great story between father and son, and, and it tells a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of telling details. So, Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, I do think it's an interesting uh, kind of fulcrum moment between the two. You know, mm -hmm. Jerry Brown's a lot of things. One of the things he is is he's the son of a very popular California governor. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, between the two of them, they have a large chunk of California history is, yes. uh, under the leadership of one or the other. Um, in, uh, in 1960, Jerry Brown had just emerged uh, from the seminary uh, where he'd spent three and a half years to be a Jesuit priest. Um, he had just left the seminary, it was at UC Berkeley, when Chessman's execution was scheduled to take place. Kel Chessman uh, was a rapist and a robber uh, from uh, Southern California, from Los Angeles. Um, he was convicted of those offenses um, and sentenced to death. Uh, now, uh, these days, you can't be sentenced to death for a non-murder. Uh, he mm -hmm. was not convicted of murder. And so that alone uh, made it a controversial case. Um, he, he professed to be innocent, not of everything, but of the crimes that he was convicted of. Um, he wrote a very um, uh, widely read and appreciated memoir in prison uh, about his life in prison uh, that attracted a lot of attention and a lot of sympathy to him all of which made his execution uh, a complicated uh, 
prospect for Pat Brown to uh-huh. uh, engage with. Uh, Pat Brown was very conflicted about it. Um, like his son, a Catholic, um, opposed the death penalty personally. Um, he did, Carol Chessman did not make it easy to spare his life. Chessman sort of taunted Pat Brown as Pat Brown considered whether to put him to death. Yeah. Um, and uh, then when he was on the verge of allowing the execution to go forward in February of 1960, he got a call from Jerry, uh, his son, again, freshly out of the seminary, called him from a payphone in Berkeley, um, got him at home at the mansion alone, uh, partly because Jerry's uh, mother and sister were in Squaw Valley for the opening of the mm-hmm. uh, Olympics. Um, and so he got through to his father, and he persuaded his father to postpone uh, the execution of Chessman. Um, uh, his father decided to do that. Um, he postponed it and then kicked the matter over to the legislature, hoping that the legislature would abolish the death penalty during the period while the execution was uh, on hold. Um, that was a, well, arguably that was a sound piece of moral reasoning on Jerry Brown's part. It was not a wise piece of political advice. Um, right. Because what ended up happening is that Pat Brown delayed the execution. The legislature unsurprisingly refused to abolish the death penalty. And then Brown ultimately, Pat Brown, allowed the execution to go forward. So he ended up antagonizing virtually everyone. Anyone who wanted trust and spared was mad that he was executed. Anyone who wanted him uh, to be executed was mad that the execution was postponed. Um, so it was not deftly handled uh, as a political matter. Um, but it does reflect, I think, the, uh, the conflicting impulses that both Pat Brown and Jerry Brown dealt with, uh, Catholic upbringing, uh, public policy, questions of how those two intersect. Um, and uh, and it was played out, I use this as you know, the opening passage of the book takes place in Candlestick Park, uh, where when Pat Brown was in this, he was booed. This is April 1960, the first day that baseball was played at Candlestick. And he was booed uh, largely because of the Chessman execution. At that point, Chessman's mm-hmm. execution was still uh, stayed. So he was roiled by controversy as a result of this case. Yeah, not, you say not definitely handled politically, it reminded me of that. One thing my father said, he was mayor of Kenosha, Wisconsin, about 100,000 people okay. for about 10 years, same time that Governor Pat Brown was governor. And uh, he, he told me when he retired uh, at the end of 10 years, he, he didn't run again. He said, if you're an honest politician uh, that always does tries to do the right thing, uh, by the end of 10 years, you've uh, made at least half of the population against you. And, <laughs> and, and it's, you know, he's also had a Catholic upbringing, same, same kind of background. So it it gets in the way. It gets in the way of your political decisions, but it's an interesting element added to to the political differences. So let's before we uh, go to Governor Jerry Brown, let's let's uh, again let's do one more thing about Pat and his dad. Um, you, you talk about his legacy. You also have a lot of interesting, funny things about legacy itself. And, and do governors have legacy? Because okay. that's something uh, Governor Jerry Brown was talked about a lot. But there's two big things. I mean, we're uh, of the age that when we applied for college. Berkeley was considered the best public school in the in the entire country by a lot, but that was that was so, sort of created by Governor Pat Brown, right? Mm-hmm. And he, did, he he created that, and so it was not that far. I mean, when we were children, it was what he was. Well, when I was a child, you were about to be born. That was when that work was going on. So the California public school system got this big reputation, and and has now been fighting for things for a long time. But it 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 really was a big legacy because people. There was no question about who was best. Yeah, I think, um, uh, well, as you say, uh, or hint at, the legacy question is a complicated one with respect to Jerry. Right. Uh, when it comes to Pat, Jerry Brown took in his final term to, to insisting that governors don't have legacies. Right. I've argued about this now for the better part of five years. Um, uh, I, I don't believe it. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't believe that Jerry Brown believes it either. <laughs> uh, I think it's a, his way of deflecting a question that he found irritating and somewhat lazy. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, one and one of the reasons I believe that he doesn't really believe it is that he's never said to me that his father doesn't have a legacy. Right. Um, and his father does, in fact, have a legacy, as does he, by the way. But um, Pat Brown's legacies, uh, there, there's a number, uh, but the two that stand out the most, I would say, would be the construction of an absolutely world-class uh, University of California system, and the master plan for higher education that governed the rest of California's higher education system, the community colleges and the, and the, the state uh, universities as well, um, and the water system uh, that Pat Brown completed or largely completed what we today utterly rely upon, which is a distribution system of water, but from mm-hmm. north to south, but also actually in some ways more importantly from the Sierra as west to San Francisco, uh, Bay Area, and also Los Angeles. Um, 
all of that is Pat Brown's doing. And I don't think, I don't think any reasonable person by which I deliberately exclude Jerry Brown um, would, <laughs> would argue that that's not an actual legacy. And as I yeah. say, Jerry's is his own, but that's clearly part of Pat. So uh, now uh, Governor Jerry Brown, as a young man, uh, was, of course, young during the 60s, San Francisco, Summer of Love, that whole thing, but he did not, that's, that was not his milieu. He was a conservative young lawyer, um, and then he, he got a job, his first political uh, job that he won the election on was for the uh, L.A. County, what was it? Uh, Community College. Community College, yeah. yeah. Tell, tell the story a little bit about how he, first of all, with the name recognition, he came in first, et cetera, et cetera, but that, he was offered the chairmanship. I, I, I thought that was very fascinating. So, yeah, I mean, he ran for the office really as a way to get into politics. Um, he, he was testing a little bit to see uh, what kind of uh, recognition he would enjoy. He's from Northern California, of course, grew up in San Francisco. Uh, he was living in LA at the time, um, working for Tuttle and Taylor, a, a small but very prestigious law firm um, in Los Angeles. You know, um, uh, and so this was an opportunity for him to dip a toe in the water of politics. It was a brand new body. Uh, the, uh, the state had decreed that every community college system or every community college needed a board to oversee it. So the Los Angeles, this was the, the creation of the Los Angeles County uh, Community College Board. Uh, he ran in a field, I think it was 143 candidates and finished first. Um, mm -hmm. There were two uh, elections, or, or election or runoff, but once he finished first in the first round, it was obvious he was going to win, and he did. Um, uh, his service on there, he was very young. Uh, he was 34, 33, 34 years old uh, mm -hmm. when he was elected. Um, actually, even younger than that, because he served as Secretary of State, so even as uh, or late 20s, early 30s, uh, when mm -hmm. he was elected to the board. Um, you know, he's a bit of a gadfly, a bit of a bomb thrower. Uh, he used it to get a lot of attention. He needled his colleagues. But you're absolutely right. In that first meeting, he was actually nominated for chairman of that board. Mm -hmm. He declined to seek the election. Uh, he and I talked about this at some length at the very end of the book, in fact, um, uh, partly because he knew he wouldn't win. There was a real schism within the board between a uh -huh. conservative wing and a liberal wing. And he uh, almost certainly would have lost if it had come to a vote. Uh, instead, he, he passed on it. Um, and then, you know, he, he used the office both to achieve some things and, and raise some questions about the management of the system and also clearly to make some news. Um, he used it as a launch pad uh, for his subsequent political career. He went from there to running for Secretary of State, which gave him a statewide post, and then from that back to governor. He was elected governor at age 36. So this is five years ago. This is really and when he decided to go to state office, you know, and, and, and expand out, he, he had to make a choice. And, and uh, it was a political choice. I mean, there was there were options and he made a choice. So maybe that story is also. Yeah, uh, he, uh, he was look, he looked at the office of secretary of state. Again, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, with Jerry Brown over the last five years. I've never seen I've never heard him speak uh, as if the secretary of state job was the job that he had always coveted. Uh, I don't think it was. <laughs> I think he clearly saw it as a move toward the governorship um, right. or to statewide office or to to higher office in any event um uh and uh but he uh he ran on a platform he ran as a an interesting as an only jerry brown kind of sort of way uh as both an insider and an outsider he was the outside fresh voice in, in state politics at the same time that he was the son of the former popular popular former governor mm -hmm. um and then he used that office, uh, which had been held by a father and son uh, for decades. Uh, so it really was the first time it had genuine new blood in that office in a very long time. Um, he used it to do some innovative things. He, among most importantly, uh, he oversaw the creation of the Fair Political Practices uh, Act in California, which mm -hmm. created the reform, the, the financing and disclosure structure, much modified in the years since, but that remains the, the basic structure of uh, California finance and, and disclosure laws uh, and is overseen by the body that it created the Fair Political Practices Commission. So that then became the platform upon which Brown ran for governor uh, in 1974. Yeah, not too many people accomplish something as Secretary of State you know, like that, right? So um, y y another very interesting point you make in your book is um, how he related to Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Um, that he, that the, the, the dichotomy between these two characters that we see uh, if you look at anything from 1985 you know, on or something like that was not really as strong as, as it seemed at the time, that Jerry had some appreciation for how he did things. 
Yeah, that's really true. And I must say that uh, people sometimes ask me what was most surprising to me uh, in the course of this research. And it's hard to rank them, but certainly one of them would be, I very much expected that when we got to the subject of Ronald Reagan, that, that Jerry Brown would be dismissive um, mm -hmm. or, uh, or, you know, uh, or, you know, vehement in his uh, opposition to Reagan, whether mm -hmm. he's his father, um, chose Pat Brown out of office. Um, right. uh, you know, one, one of the things Jerry Brown likes to say is that the only, the two, two times he was elected governor, both times he followed an actor into office. Because <laughs> of course he was Reagan and then Schwarzenegger. Um, but the fact is, well, for a variety of reasons, I think they are, their governorships are less different than you might think. Um, mm -hmm. uh, partly because Reagan was not the conservative icon as governor that he later became as president. Mm -hmm. um, he supported the largest uh, tax increase uh, at that point of uh, any non-president uh, in the history of the United States. Um, he supported an expansion of abortion rights uh, as governor. He supported mm -hmm. uh, a kind of groundbreaking uh, gun control uh, measure uh, in California. Uh, so he was a very pragmatic governor, uh, almost a cent He was very conservative in his rhetoric, but much more uh, centrist in his actual governing. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, that's, that describes Jerry Brown. Uh, Jerry Brown more pragmatic than ideological, I think, mm -hmm. uh, as governor. Um, Jerry Brown much more liberal in his rhetoric and Reagan much more conservative in his rhetoric. But when it came to actually doing things, balancing the budget, uh, getting programs through, they were less different than they appeared. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I think that Jerry Brown, uh, frankly, admired uh, in Reagan was his mastery of television and campaign. Uh, yeah. And he saw how much better Reagan was than his father uh, at that. And so... Far from being angered by Reagan's uh, use of the medium to be his father, he actually was sort of instructed by it. I think he learned from it. Um, and I wouldn't call him an admirer of Ronald Reagan, certainly not of Reagan the president, right. uh, but uh, an appreciator of him, and much, mm -hmm. much more so than I expected going into this, this project. Well, you, you, you say uh, that he, that Governor Jerry Brown, uh, admired his abilities on, on the media, uh, you know, yeah. with media and so on. Um, and you tell a great story that I had never heard before about um, the debate with William F. Buckley Jr. on oh, the old firing that. line. And and it just, it's like, he must have been so happy that he'd taken all that debate under the Jesuits. <laughs> really? So, <laughs> tell, I, tell, I, the, tell the story. It's just a yeah, great story. I'd I really recommend it uh, for any of you who are uh, watching and listening today. If you have a chance and you're interested, Google Jerry Brown, William F. Buckley, or you know, go to YouTube, Jerry Brown, William F. Buckley, Fire in Line, um, right. and you can watch it for yourself. It is, um, it's like, it's first of all, you just can't believe that it's happening on television. Um, yeah. It is such a uh, deep, esoteric debate about Catholic philosophy and its intersection with Brown versus Board of Education versus with the primacy of the federal government and how that compares to the papacy and whether Thomas Aquinas is properly thought of as a liberal or a conservative. I mean, I, this is not the Kardashians, you know? I mean, this is, <laughs> there's this serious conversation going on here. Um, and it is hard, you, when you watch it, you really get a sense that Buckley thought this was gonna be a lot easier than it was. Yeah. Uh, you know, Buckley, of course, uh, you know, famously, uh, uh, sort of, you know, deep in, in philosophy and obviously very conservative. And I think probably, like many people in those days, uh, underestimated how um, how deep Brown was schooled uh, mm -hmm. in that same material. Jerry Brown is not easily out uh by William F. Buckley. Uh, he really stuck with him, um, and it's a it's a it's a wonderful piece of television. Um, and you've got it's also sort of you know, layered on top of it is that kind of seventies feeling. You've got all these young people sitting cross-legged, you know. Beneath the podium, and they're in their swivel chairs. And yeah, really, it's a great period. <laughs> well, you tell. We'll, we'll skip to a different time period, but you also tell of another unusual piece of, of political theater on TV, which is with Bill Clinton. Yeah, um, and and that also during the uh, competition between them for the presidency. Um, and, and tell that story. I thought it was very yeah. interesting that the, the moderator, well, Merv Griffin, I think, just uh, stepped uh, aside. Yeah, Phil Donahue. Um, Donahue, yeah. yeah, it's so uh, that again, I, I would recommend to anyone who's interested in it, it's easily found. Um, uh, that's one of the most interesting conversations in the context of a presidential campaign between political figures that I have ever seen. 
Um, and it's the format is almost bewildering. And it was to the candidates too. Donahue invited the two of them on this daytime television. It was right before the New York primary in 1992. Um, uh, Clinton clearly in the driver's seat. They had had several spirited, frankly, kind of mean spirited uh, debates leading mm -hmm. up to that. They did not like each other. Um, I still do not, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. But um, there was real tension uh, between them. And so the two of them show up on the set together. It's sort of there's surface cordiality, but you can tell it's there, it, there's tension between them. And then Donahue just says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Brown, you know, Governor Jerry Brown, Governor Bill Clinton, see ya. Uh, and he sits back and he does not say <laughs> another word. And the two of them kind of look at each other like, are we, what are we supposed to do here? Uh, and, and they start to talk. Um, mm -hmm. And Brown, uh, I think to his credit, I, I don't know whether he did this deliberately, but um, he starts on a very gentle tone. The two of them are talk about their growing up. Um, there are things that are curiously uh, parallel about their lives um, mm -hmm. and, and things that are very different. Um, and they have a conversation. Uh, the two of them sat there for whatever it is, a better part of an hour. Um, and just talk with absolutely no guidance, no audience, uh, so no applause, no interruptions. Um, and they talked about spirituality and their youth and growing older and healthcare. And uh, it's a, it is a really wonderful conversation. Now, uh, Clinton went on to beat him handily uh, in New York, and that was pretty much the end of the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. So you're also catching this at a moment when when you, you know what you know, watching it, you know that Brown is about to be out of this race. Um, so there's right. a poignance that attaches to it as a result if you're coming at it from my perspective. But um, but just as a pure moment of politics, it's just a really engaging, uplifting, intellectual conversation between two very smart guys who do not particularly like it. Yeah, and, and uh, one of them doesn't didn't deserve the uh, nickname Governor Moonbeam. You, you talk about that too, and we have to go back to when he was running the first time. That was the last time he ran, I think, in 92, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, he runs three times, uh, 76, 80, and 92. Uh, the 1980 race is when uh, Mike Royko dubbed him Governor Moonbeam. Um, you know, Royko went on to regret uh, having uh, done that. Um, and it was, it was incorrect when he said it, and it became even more incorrect over time. Mm. Uh, you know, what Royko was trying to put his finger on, I think, um, was a combination of what he saw as Brown's kind of flakiness, um, uh, you know, solar energy, Linda Ronstad, new politics. But then also he kind of folds into that his general disdain for California, which he sees as a flaky place and mm -hmm. not credible. He talks about having watched some science fiction movie and how it seemed like a documentary about California. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of the, I mean, listen, I've, I've been a newspaper columnist. I understand uh, that it's possible to, glibness sometimes trumps, uh, sometimes <laughs> trumps real, real thought. And that's what Royka was guilty of there. Yeah. Um, you know, sadly, I think it's safe to say that Brown will never entirely live it down. It really mm -hmm. did uh, attach itself to him as an enemy long after Royko uh, published a second column saying I wish he hadn't done the first. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it, you know, I, I, I suspect that it's true that today, people who came to know Jerry Brown in the third and fourth terms, that almost no one would think of him as flaky or fringy. No, 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 yeah. Uh, the nickname itself may hang around him just because he's been around for so long. Um, right. But he clearly outgrew it. And as I say, I think it was unfair even in the first iteration, but by now it seems woefully out of date. Well, one of the reasons that California, I mean, obviously there are all kinds of things going on in California that the rest of the country, certainly the Midwestern, uh, you know, normal people thought California <laughs> going off the deep end and why it's called the left coast rather than the west coast, all those kind of things. But uh, I think a lot of people aren't so clearly aware of two really big events in 1978, I think it was, that really had a big impact on, on politics in California in addition to its reputation. And that was the Jonestown thing and, and then the shooting of uh, Mayor Moscone and, and uh, the supervisor of Milk, Harvey Milk, at the same, basically the same week almost, or the same 10 days or something yeah, like very that. Very close together. Yeah. And people don't, don't realize that they were somewhat connected in that, that, the, the, that the city hall in San Francisco was afraid that uh, people from Jonestown were going to do it. The other thing that people don't know is that the people from Jonestown and, and Jim Jones was very successful because 
he had ingratiated himself with so many California politicians by supplying all kinds of help for their campaigns and so on. I, if you could put those two stories together, it, yeah. I think most people don't have that context. So yeah, I um, well, first of all, let me just say that this for me is a very personal story. I, I was a high school student in the Bay Area at the time, um, mm-hmm. uh, and after Jonestown, uh, I. I I don't have specific, I certainly didn't have any personal relationship to anyone mm. who was affected by Jonestown. I didn't know people in the church or anything. Um, but it was such a ghastly tragedy. Um, yeah. Almost a thousand people dead, um, combinations of, of suicide and murder, um, cult aspects of it, um, the political implications, as you say. Um, it, was, it, it was still so fresh when just a couple of weeks later, uh, the Moscone assassination uh, occurred, um, and and the initial uh, I remember feeling, uh, thinking that they were connected, uh, that somehow mm-hmm. the, the the tragedy of Jonestown had manifested itself in a killing at City Hall. Um, mm-hmm. And I will say this: uh, I've I've uh, interviewed Diane Feinstein many times uh, since mm-hmm. then, I've included for this book, um, and uh, I've gotten to know her as a senator, of course, in, in her current life. But I will never forget the feeling of her taking control in the wake of the Moscone killing, and announcing those assassinations and announcing that she had it under control. The, I, there will always be a warm place in my heart for Feinstein and what she did through that tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now, of course, it turns out that they were, they were utterly unrelated. Um, right. Uh, but that didn't really become clear for a while. Um, and then, you know, the, the Moscone assassination is, of course, a tragedy in its own right. He was such a promising and you know, uh, exciting mayor of San Francisco. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then, you know, Dan, the fact that he was killed by a fellow supervisor, uh, or mm-hmm. I guess a former supervisor, the whole thing felt uh, chaotic uh, and scary. And I remember, as I said, I remember that on a, on a, on a personal level. Um, the other thing, it's unrelated to either of those, but that also happened in that sort of summer and fall of 1978 is passage of Prop 13 uh, in California. So that was a really, that's a really busy time uh, in the life of, of California, all of which felt, um, uh, all of them unrelated to one another and yet united by this sense of, of things not working, of, of a kind of breakdown at some right. fundamental level, um, distrust in government, cults, uh, assassination, violence, uh, all of it felt uh, uh, chaotic and, and very much as if the place were just going off a precipice. Um, it doesn't feel that way today, and that's to the credit of a lot of leaders, not the least of them, which is Jerry Brown. Governor Jerry Brown, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and, and uh, the view from Chicago was certainly, you know, well, what did you expect when you invited all the hippies to come to San Francisco? What did you think was going to happen? I mean, that's the kind of, you know... Uh, yeah. Well, and I think, yeah. yeah, and I think that's where Brown at the time got kind of unfairly wrapped into that. There right. was, I think if people from the East Coast or the Midwest who looked at California and thought, wow, that is just a mess out there. That is mm-hmm. a, that's just a hippie chaos mess. And the governor happens to be this kind of young, um, unmarried, mm-hmm. uh, living, in, you know, living on, sleeping on a mattress on the floor, refusing to live in the mansion. It all just, I think for people outside of California, it felt, all part of a piece uh, yeah. of something that was just uh, dividing off from the rest of the country. I, I think in, right now, California, I think, is seen more appropriately as a leader of trends, not as a breakaway kind of republic. Mm-hmm. But at the time, that all, for a, that that affected people's co- uh, sense of Brown, I think. And that's where Moonbeam, that's that's not why Rico coined the, the term Governor Moonbeam, but it's partly why it stuck. I, I agree with that. I think it's interesting you 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 mentioned about the overall uh, effect of that where California leads trends now. Um, we had a, uh, other other authors, professors have, have written about how the overall freedom of the area allows for kind of crazy stuff on one side, but also the the uh, the ability to think outside the box on the other and making progress. So they they kind of go together. Um, and it's it's not that you do it for one or for the other, but the freedom itself allows us to, to move forward. So yeah. and that's that's what America is supposed to be based upon, but that doesn't mean that everybody likes it. <laughs> yeah, I think the same society that gives you the summer of love gives you Silicon Valley. You know, yeah. um, exactly. and not not that they are you know intertwined with one another, but they do grow out of a common 
uh, exploratory spirit and, uh, and idea. Um, and so, yeah, great things happen and some chaotic things happen too. <clears throat> well, you mentioned when you were talking about the time, uh, the, the Proposition 13, the tax thing, and, and uh, we don't have to talk in detail about that, but, uh, but the frugality, Jerry Brown's frugality uh, is an issue. And actually someone just uh, asked a question, sent in a question, and it was uh, Warren Hellman, who grew up with Jerry Brown, notes that Jerry was quite frugal. Is this something you found as well? Definitely. In other words, that, that, that's, that's a part of your story. And uh, he had he had already put aside some money so that when Proposition 13 came in, you, you, you could tell the story. But yeah, it. well, first of all, let me just say, um, some people have, have tried to say that Jerry's um, frugality indicates a kind of underlying conservatism. Mm -hmm. Sort of true. I think there's a there's a belief in tradition that he really carries from the Jesuit, uh, his mm -hmm. Jesuit upbringing. Um, but he's also, <laughs> I say this uh, with, uh, with full consciousness, Cheap. Uh, and he'd be the one to say that he's cheap. Um, he's the guy who's, you know, was famous for never having, never carrying around cash and for mm -hmm. making friends pick up tabs. And uh, he, uh, he went with Willie Brown, former mayor of uh, San Francisco, right. as you all know. When I interviewed Willie Brown, um, he said to me, what we were talking about, and I said to him at one point, you know, describe your relationship. Are you friends? Are you business associates? Or, you know, what is your relationship with Jerry Brown? And he said, no, no, we're friends. When he's in the city, we'll have dinner. And he goes, and just once, I wish that guy would pick up a check. Uh, <laughs> which I thought was funnier than Jerry Brown thought. But in any case, um, uh, you know, he is a, he's a real penny. But his mom was a coupon clipper. And he really believes that you need to balance your budgets. And you watch the bottom line. And mm -hmm. he may be the most balanced budget person left in American politics. Uh, you know, they, they, that used to be a, a Republican notion that the Democrats pulled back against now, it's not clear to me that either party really believes in it. Um, no, we're, uh, we're way over a trillion dollars a year already. And in, 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 yeah, in I mean, there, there's you know. no party of fiscal discipline left. No, not at all. Um, <laughs> but there is Jerry, um, and yeah. he really does believe in it. He really believes that that is the an obligation of government. He supported the balanced budget amendment, when it was a very unpopular thing for yeah. people uh, in, uh, in his presidential uh, campaigns. Um, and he balanced the California budget of 16 times. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the 70s, he ran a surplus, as he did uh, at the end of his uh, fourth term. Mm -hmm. uh, one consequence of the surplus, one negative consequence, I think a lot of people would say, um, is that it raised questions for, for, for taxpayers who felt that they were being overtaxed at the, for their homes. Mm -hmm. Property taxes, property values were increasing rapidly in the 1970s, the late 1970s, um, and because property taxes are set as a percentage of the value of the home as the mm -hmm. as assessed values rose, so did taxes, um, particularly for people on fixed incomes and older people. That was a real uh, uh, worry, um, a real reality that was becoming increasingly worrisome. And the fact that the state had a surplus while that was happening raised the obvious question of if you have a surplus and I'm being taxed, why can't you use the surplus to cut my taxes? Right. Um, Brown, uh, I think it's fair to say, underestimated the the um, passion behind that feeling. Mm -hmm. He, like a lot of leaders in Sacramento, did not see the, the Prop 13 as a serious challenge uh, to mm -hmm. the tax structure until it was too late. Uh, by the time they did, they passed a kind of half-hearted, halfway measure that never uh, caught the public imagination like Prop 13 did, um, and it passed. Now, a um, couple things about its passage. And one of the things that Proposition 13 did is it made it very difficult to raise taxes in the future without a two-thirds vote, um, which is ironic because Proposition 13 did actually not get a two-thirds vote. Um, it got quite close to it, but it didn't. So it imposed a threshold that it itself did not meet. Um, mm -hmm. um, it transferred a lot of power from local governments to the state, because the state through the tax structure, the state then became the recipient of tax receipts and then doled them back out. Um, and its immediate impact was blunted. Uh, I, again, I was a high school student in 1978 when Proposition 13 passed, and I remember the feeling was that it would bring a real doom, you know, the next day uh, to public education. I was in public high school at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't. And it didn't partly because Brown had built up a surplus, and it took several years to work that surplus out. Mm -hmm. Once that happened, uh, then California began to feel the full impact of it. Um, uh, so... And that, that's, a, in a sense, Jerry Brown's frugality uh, was the right thing to do from a fiscal perspective in the 70s, mm -hmm. but may have been the wrong thing uh, in terms of the politics of it. Uh, now, this time, 
uh, he inherited a you know, 25, 26 billion dollar shortfall from Arnold Schwarzenegger in 2011. He left with about a 20 billion dollar, it's kind of how you measure, but about a 20 billion dollar surplus um, mm -hmm. for a rainy day. Uh, that rainy day came torrentially uh, in the form of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So the state will eat through the whole thing this year, but it's going to be 20 billion dollars less uh, painful than it would have been. Um, and that's right. part of the problem. And, and, he, and, and he, as you explain, his way of thinking about life, his way of uh, his Catholic background plus the Zen was such that you, you would prepare for disaster because it's, it's not always there, but it, it, it does come. And he, he told the story from the Bible of Joseph, um, you know, with the seven, uh, with the dream that the Pharaoh had about the seven fat cows and the seven lean cows. And right. I, thought, I don't think too many politicians would use that to sell something. <laughs> I, uh... I don't know anybody who quotes scripture or speaks Latin in politics more often than Jerry Brown. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, listen, that is that is that is who he is, um, and no. um, uh, and yes, I think part of he is a fatalist, but he is a realist that he does understand that there is uh, there are seasons and things come and go, and there are good times and there are bad times. Um, and and as I say, he more than, than really anyone I know in politics really thinks about the bad time that is around the corner and tries to yeah yeah well it, it certainly it certainly helped uh, back at the time proposition 13 passed as you said it might have influenced the fact that it passed which is something right. you can't, um if, if maybe he had tucked it all away in the calpers uh, public pension <laughs> fund at the time there wouldn't have been this and they would they would have a little bit more money but how can anybody see all that stuff so uh you you mentioned uh just a, one more personal aside for, for Jerry's life. Uh, you mentioned his friend Barzaghi, and that, that almost all politicians seem to have a friend like this. <laughs> uh, well, maybe not quite like this, but yes. <laughs> I take that um, and it, it, it lasted a very long time, but eventually he had to fire him from his job when he was in Oakland. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the other thing I wanted to talk before he became back to, to governor again, um, maybe, maybe you can put those two things together. How did Jerry get back into the office as governor because he took a very interesting path to get there yeah. and, and it was a thought out yeah, yeah well Barzag those are uh, related but different questions um right. Barzaghi, uh was a kind of uh, yeah adjunct figure to Jerry Brown for a long time this is by the time I was sitting down with Jerry Brown Barzaghi was was gone um yeah. so he was not part of my conversations with him and although he came up several times in conversation Brown didn't have much to say about him uh, yeah um, very exotic uh, creature, um, and you know it, it was famous for these kind of oracular pronouncements about politics and, and Jerry's place in them, um, and also just a difficult character. Um, he uh, ultimately um, there was a there was a police uh, response on a domestic violence call when Brown was mayor of Oakland. Um, that in the aftermath of that. Uh, there was some investigation about Barzaghi and some allegations of sexual harassment um, that uh, related to his work for the Oakland government. Mm -hmm. uh, Brown got rid of him. Um, as far as I know, they have not spoken since. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think some of those around Brown, particularly who wanted him to return to the governorship, saw that as overdue, that they mm -hmm. viewed Barzaghi as, a, as an impediment to his return to power, that he, he reminded people of that that sort of flakier period in uh, Brown's mm -hmm. life. Um, but Brown, who returned to office uh, in the 2010 race and ultimately returned to office in 2011, um, is, is a very different uh, presentation. His presentation to voters was very different than he was when he was 36 years old. Now, California, the second time through, 28 years after he'd left office, most people who were casting votes in that election had never voted for or against him before. Mm -hmm. um, um, so he's a new face in, a, in an interesting way. Um, and yet for a lot of Californians, myself included, it was a return uh, and a reminder of this now kind of gauzy period of California's past. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the, when he came through the second time, California was in dire shape when he ran in 2010. Um, you know, people were writing about comparing it to Greece and it was a failed state and mm -hmm. talking about bankruptcy, what would bankruptcy mean for a state, uh, institution size of California. The bond uh, rating was terrible. Bond rating was terrible. You know, uh, it was all the, you know, all of these sort of 
foreign press, you know, dusted off the kind of, you know, golden state is now the dying state and everyone sort of, you know, played out their California cliches. Um, uh, and Brown turned it around, uh, you know, I mean, not, not by himself and not without the help of the economy also improving, did. Um, but, you know, the American economy improved in large measure because of the California economy. Mm-hmm. So they, they go hand in hand. Um, um, you know, and Brown uh, did that. Uh, again, his frugality in this case very much helped him through that crisis. He was able both to uh, to cut government spending and also to persuade voters to raise taxes, and extend and raise taxes. Um, that latter piece of it, by the way, he had promised during the campaign, um, Meg Whitman called him a, during the campaign in 2010, she called him a tax and spend liberal. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, half true. He's a tax liberal. He's really not a spend liberal. He's a tax and save liberal, if anything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so it was not really accurate. Um, but in order, partly in order to fend off that getting any traction, he promised that he would not raise taxes without a vote of the people. Um, mm-hmm. I was at the LA Times at the time, on the editorial board of the LA Times, and I thought that was crazy. Um, mm-hmm. I just thought he'd locked himself into a promise, as did my colleagues, that he had locked himself into a promise. financial problems. Instead, he pulled it off. Um, uh, he, uh, secured, he did secure some spending cuts. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he raised the prospect that if the, if the tax extensions weren't and, and increases weren't passed, that students would have to pay part of the burden because tuition would have to go up. Mm-hmm. That helped Put, galvanize student support for the tax measure. Right. Um, and very much against the polling, or at least the public polling, um, he pulled it out of his hat. He campaigned with his corgi and <laughs> appeared on college campuses yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and won. Um, and it's the combination of those tax increases uh, and the spending cuts that really helped turn the government out. Well, we have a lot more questions uh, coming in. Um, I'm going to some of them are right on what I was going to ask anyway. So uh, one of the things that was asked was, during your research, what is something that most surprised you to, to find out about Governor Brown? Um, well, I mentioned the Reagan, um, right. his reaction to Reagan. Uh, that was certainly one. Um, you know, I, I guess the overarchingly, um, and there's not a particular moment of surprise in this, but as I got to know him better and as we spent more and more time together, I was really struck by how traditional uh, he is in certain mm-hmm. ways. Uh, for a person who is so associated with that kind of new left in the 1970s in California, mm-hmm. his references are, you know, to, you know, they are to Wittgenstein and to the Jesuits and to mm-hmm. Martin Buber. And uh, I mean, his, he's a classicist um, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and not there's nothing uh, fringy about any of that. Um, mm. It's very anchored in very ancient intellectual and philosophical thought. Um, and that's really what we spent, I would say, probably the majority of our time talking about. <laughs> I remember one moment where he was talking about Martin Buber, and I guess he caught the kind of blank look on my face. And he said, you yeah. read Buber. And I said, well, not, not much. And he said, really? Well, where'd you go to school? I said, well, for what it's worth, I went to public school in California and you were the governor. So who's <laughs> um, you know, uh, and, and By the way, that then sort of reminds me one other thing that I guess I wasn't surprised at, but that I was struck by is his just desire to argue. Uh, he's mm-hmm. a really argumentative person. And, and I found it tremendously entertaining and fun. Um, I, some people, I think, find it difficult. He can he can be short with people. He can be brusque. Yeah. Um, uh, he does not like uh, to be agreed with. Um, he would much prefer, I think, to be argued with. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I would come out. We would often talk for four or five hours at a time. And I would just come out. Like, I thought I had lost 10 pounds. I mean, it was like <laughs> ending the conversation. Um, but it was really, it's, he is really smart. Um, and yeah. he is, as I said, very rooted in classic uh, thinking and philosophy. He's he's not a he's not a, a modernist. Uh, he's an ancient. In that sense. Well, you just answered one of my questions was whether he ever in your inter- interviews with him for the book did he ever draw you into a Jesuitical debate about ideas that had nothing to do with the book? And obviously, it, it happened a lot. The answer is yes. Uh, and um, I mean, I wouldn't say that it never that it had nothing to do with the book because the book more and more I think in a certain way became about that because I became mm-hmm. more and more interested in his. Um, 
his grounding in those ideas. Um, uh, so they were all relevant to the book, but I will tell you this, I would usually, come, I would prepare for, I, I did a book a few years ago with Liam Panetta, um, mm -hmm. very different project, it was his book and I helped him write it. But the way, the way we would work is, you know, I would say I'm gonna be up in Monterey, which is where he is, uh, for, for, you know, five, four days, uh, the following you know, on such and such a date, can we spend those four days talking about your work with Bill Clinton? And mm. we would sit down and we would work through them, you know, chronologically, methodically. That is not the way my you know, conversations with Jerry Brown. I mean, I would come and I would say, you know, can we talk about Obamacare? Mm -hmm. And we would talk about, you know, the, the history of the polio vaccine. Um, yep. or, uh, you know, I remember asking him once to describe the house he grew up in. And I'm not kidding you, his answer somehow incorporated the history of the kibbutz. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a he's a thinker, um, yeah. and he, I realized fairly early on it was pointless to try to make him draw between the lines and mm -hmm. uh, just talk about the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, incidentally, oh, I will stop talking after this. But um, one of the uh, many journalists I think have been frustrated by trying to interview him over the years, uh -huh. and Adam McGurney at the New York Times once wrote a very really funny piece on how to interview. <laughs> Helped me, by the way. Um, but um, one of the reasons he can be frustrating, if you're a daily journalist and you have 15 minutes with Jerry Brown and you need to get an answer to a specific question, you might get it or you might not, you know, because if only if he's interested in answering that question, we get the answer. So I think some of them um, find him uh, difficult. Uh, I had a real luxury here for which I am grateful to him uh, and his wife in particular, um, which is we just had essentially unlimited time. Um, mm -hmm. And if you if you do have that luxury to be able to spend a lot of time with him, he'll answer the question um, as long as you're willing to talk about things that he's interested in too. Uh, so ultimately, I don't I don't feel like he ever refused to answer a question or that I didn't get an answer to something I really needed. Uh, but you know, on the way, I learned a lot about a lot of things I didn't think I would not have thought to ask. Him. Are there any other politicians that you've run into over the years that have a part of that in their approach? Anybody that you would compare him to? I know he's pretty unique, but. Yeah. Uh, I've met a lot of people in politics. I've been writing about politics in particularly in California for my whole adult life, really. Um, mm -hmm. And some of them are very smart. Mm -hmm. um, Barack Obama is very smart. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton, Antonio Villaraigosa. Um, I mean, you know, I've met a lot of people who are very bright, but their intelligence tends to run to politics, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, on, on, on some of them have just uncanny abilities to remember, you know, the vote count in Alameda County in, you know, 1982, and, you know, how Alameda has changed, how the demographics have changed, and what that means for the strategy. To, um, I have never met anyone else, certainly in politics, and maybe anywhere, um, who, who combines that kind of uh, tactical knowledge with really deep intellectual curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. In that sense, I don't, I don't know anybody else like him. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say there isn't anybody else like him, I, but I don't know anybody else. <clears throat> well, before we, we um, finish up, I'd like to go to some of those ideas, but let's see if we can get a few more of the questions in before we talk about some of those big ideas, if we have a chance to talk more, because those are very interesting. That he, his, his work now on the nuclear weapons issue his work, um, you know, in in uh, just uh, well, the way he transformed the California judiciary—that's another thing that you talked about, which is really tremendous. People talk a lot about doing it, but he really did it. But let's let's uh, get the audience's questions in. Um, can you talk about Governor Brown's ambitions to run for president? Uh, well, we've touched on some of that already. Um, mm -hmm. He did run the three times. Um, uh, He's an ambitious person. Uh, there's, I mean, listen, nobody nobody sets out to run for president without having a high degree both of self-esteem and of uh, and ambition. Um, right. He never did it quite right. Uh, in 1976, he got in late. Uh, New Hampshire primary, Iowa caucus were long gone by the time he got in. He got in uh, in time for the mayor. The first primary he entered was Maryland, uh, where actually one of the people who really helped him was a young Nancy Pelosi, uh, whose family mm -hmm. was from Maryland and who was prominent in politics in Maryland. 
uh, in Baltimore. Um, uh, he won, uh, I believe he won every primary but one that he entered from that point forward. So he did very well, but he never could catch Carter. Carter had to be a head start. Right. In 1980, he ran um, as a kind of liberal alternative to a, a weakened Carter. At that point, I think he correctly saw that Carter was vulnerable. I think mm -hmm. Carter ultimately lost to Reagan. Um, uh, but what he underestimated it is as the liberal alternative to Carter, when, when Ted Kennedy got into that race, there was really no room left for Brown. Mm. And he stayed in too long and did not do well. Once again, of course, Kennedy then lost too. But um, there wasn't a lane left for Brown. Mm. The 1982 race against Clinton um, is, a little, is not like those two. Brown had been out of politics for some time. He left politics in 1982 after losing to Pete Wilson in the Senate race. Um, mm -hmm at a time when I think he was kind of tired of California and California was kind of tired of him and he went off for a while, did some different things. Um, he almost approached the 1992 race as, as a way back into politics, which is mm. also very Jerry Brown, that he would find his way yeah. back into politics by running for president. <laughs> um, that one had a darker feel to that campaign. Mm. Um, yeah, there was more anger uh, in that one. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, that's, uh, his, and it came out against Clinton. Um, so listen, he's... He's been, he is very ambitious. He uh, has been his whole life. He's aspired to offices. He's lost some races and he's won more than he's lost, but he's lost some too. Um, the Jared Brown at 38 years old could have you know, sort of picked up his whole um, you know, California kind of you know, a somewhat chaotic decision-making process and, and actually played it out in Washington. I think it would have been a, a rough transition for him, but it would have been an exciting period for sure. Um, yeah. and no question, but that this country's environmental future would have been better handled by Brown. Um, certainly wouldn't have the same. Yeah. Um, so the arc, uh, you know, he came back and he, he ran for mayor of Oakland, became mayor of Oakland, then he was attorney general, then he got back uh, as to governor. So um, that's the way he finished up. But there's a question, what's he doing now? And you do cover that in the book. And I think the details of that other period of time will leave for people to read in the book. <laughs> um, and, and we get to the ideas. But what's, what's Jerry doing now? What's, what's Governor Brown yeah, doing? I'll say, I'll say one very quick thing about that interim period, which is yeah. that period where he was mayor of Oakland was really important. Um, in, a, in a funny way, that's where he learned how government really works, uh, mm -hmm. on a service delivery level, on a human level, well, a step that he had kind of skipped in his first uh, ascension of power. So it's an important period uh, for understanding him. Uh, what's he doing now? He's um, he's on some boards. He's got a uh, uh, spot at UC Berkeley. He's been, well, what he's doing right now, uh, like the rest of us, is he's at home. Um, right. uh, he's at home up in Williams, California, up north of Sacramento, uh, where he lives on a ranch just west of Williams, inclusive family. Um, one of, I think it's one of only six counties that he never carried uh, in a statewide campaign. Uh, so he's in slightly unfriendly turf, although I think people are getting used to him. Um, you know, he works. <laughs> he's not, he didn't move there just to just to try to win it next time when he runs. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I guess give him a leg up. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a the family. It's been in the family for a long time, so that's right. why. He can't. But he uh, loves it. He's got a really fun uh, house there. Um, uh, and you know, he's working, he's working on nuclear weapons. He's working on climate change. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I suspect he'll do some more with criminal justice. He may be doing some, some of that already. Those are, those are the issues I think that really animate him. Um, and he still has a lot to say, you know, I mean, he and I, um, have done a couple of things together over the last uh, few weeks. So I sort of caught up with him. Um, I hadn't spoken to him for a few months. One of the first time in years that I hadn't spoken to him for a few months. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but you know he is sharp and uh, got a, he's got you know a message to get out there. Uh, I think messages to get out there. I, I suspect that probably the over time once this crisis has passed, um, there's a lot to say, particularly about President Trump and his handling of this crisis. But once this subsides, some I, I suspect that climate change will probably be the, the main issue that drives him over the next several years. Um, it is. Um, you know, I think he can. He has a strong argument for being the, the American elected leader who's done more about this issue than any other. Um, he has his own relations with, with national governments, with China, with Mexico. And he's got standing right. with them that, that no other non-president in 
Lions country has. Um, so I think uh, I would expect to see him most active in that area. Um, yeah, you but, mentioned that, yeah, you mentioned something he said about like uh, Putin and Russia and China as well. You know, that, that uh, he, he goes right back to history and says, look, we, we worked with Stalin and, uh, you know, we accomplished something with them when we have, when we have a joint goal that we have to achieve. And there are some joint goals we need to achieve in this world. And it's just um, stupid, uh, basically, to, to not talk to these people and to not say, um, yes, we, we don't like you did this. We don't like you did this. But can we work together on this? I mean, it, it's a it's not at all a left point of view. It's not at all, you know, it, it, it's basically going back to his Catholic conservative thing. We we don't work with the devil and it's not even calling the devil. It's just that everybody is, is, is got weaknesses and, and uh, it's, it's irresponsible to not talk to people who are in charge of those countries. We're not going to change the way that they do things. In, yeah. in, in, well, he would certainly agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and, and said as much during a period where most democratic leaders uh, in a desire to emphasize uh, Putin the, the sort of odd fixation that Trump seems to have uh, right. Putin, um, where part of their response, I think, for tactical reasons was to say, you know, to, was to really demonize Putin and say we shouldn't speak to him uh, and that Trump is wrong to be uh, not taking him seriously and not understanding how villainous uh, he is in many respects. Uh, Brown wouldn't go on with that. Uh, Brown stuck very steadfast to the notion that think of him whatever you will. Um, but that in, in Brown's case, particularly the threat of nuclear of a nuclear accident or a nuclear exchange, mm-hmm. is so grave that he refuses to accept the idea that we should cut him off from the negotiations. Um, that's not the same as saying that he's naive about it. No, no, no. Not, and he's very clear out about it. <clears throat> politicians rarely do that. I mean, Bernie got in so much trouble for uh, Bernie Sanders uh, got in trouble for saying anything nice about Cuba at all. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you, we should be somewhat realistic about talking about what's going on in the world. It's very hard enough to try to solve any of those problems or work together with people without, you know, being realistic or accepting. But if you're not realistic, you haven't got a chance of, of solving any of the problems. Um, but we're not going to yeah. solve any problems tonight. So, uh, but, but uh, there's, we, we're, we're almost out of time. So um, one of the things, one of the other questions that has been asked is that the question that you raise and put down and everything like that, what do you think Jerry Brown's, uh, Governor Jerry Brown's uh, legacy is, as <laughs> and how is that different from other and previous governors? That, that is one of the questions that came in. I think it's great because you, you spent a lot of time in the book uh, talking about the fact that he didn't want to talk about yeah. it. <laughs> well, in fact, I, I titled the legacy chapter, The Legacy with Apologies. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it was such a dominant part of our conversation for so long. Um, well, let me say just briefly, what it isn't and, and what I think it is. It isn't, what it isn't is it's not a project. Legacy. It's not, I mean, yes, uh, he sought to improve the water tunnels or add these water tunnels to help convey water from the, the Delta to Southern California and, and the Bay Area. Um, yes, he supported the high-speed train, which may or may not someday really come to fruition at the moment. It seems like sort of, sort of more abundant at the moment, but someday may uh, stand as a kind of physical or monument to him and Fort Snyder, who supported it, by the way. Um, but I don't think at its heart that those are what we ought to remember Brown for. Um, I mean, I think that his his real contributions um, uh, on, on a on a specific in a specific way are about things like diversifying California, starting with the judiciary, but also the state workforce, that a real commitment to making California um, the the representation of California looked like California at a time when the state, of course, was, was diversified. Um, uh, integrity. Uh, there's really no serious scandal that one associates with Brown throughout all the, the 16 years. Somebody didn't give him that few time that he slept on? Yeah, right. What is on? And, uh, you know, and of course, on issues, things like uh, an, a, a acceptance of immigration uh, and particularly the environment. I mean, I think. Uh, as an issue, the issue that will most, uh, def- when we talk about Jerry Brown 50 years from now, 100 years from now, uh, his leadership on environmental protection, particularly climate change, I think is the mm-hmm. most important. Um, now, all of that is to the specifics of his governorship. More broadly, um, what I think is worth studying about him beyond all those things, because those things are all worth studying, mm-hmm. is 
this idea that the genuine pursuit of serious intellectual questions, of serious philosophical notions, what is our place on this planet? What are our obligations to one another? Um, what, where, what problems should government solve and what problems should government leave to families uh, or to individuals? Those are, you know, are, are the problems that define humanity itself. And Jerry Brown is willing to pursue those problems in the context of, of politics, to try to, to seek those, to, to school out those questions, not always to answer them, they're hard to answer, but mm -hmm. to genuinely engage with them. Um, and to me, that's what sets him apart from, from most, from anyone that I can think about in politics today, that I'm afraid of in politics today. But those are the real problems of human existence and far from shying from them, he really tackled them head on. And I think that's really admirable and, and, and worth considering and emulating. And I think uh, one of the things that you show in his biography is that although he was steeped in Catholicism and even studied to be a priest, and, and even though he then walked away from that, um, and he studied Zen Buddhism, and he, he, he was eclectic in, in what he went after in terms of European philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but he didn't just dismiss any of it. He didn't, he, he, he took it all seriously and said, that was a serious attempt, that was a serious attempt. And I, I think that that must have been very useful when he tried to diversify the representation in California and, and that this is what, you know, every, every culture has ideas that are useful to us if we're going to go someplace uh, future, in the future. But what we have to do is think about which ones are useful, which ones aren't so useful. Um, and as you said, there aren't very many like that. Another thing that you point out that I thought was really uh, excellent is that California all by itself is the fifth largest economy in the world. We have 40 million people, um, and, and uh, yet our economy is bigger than most countries that are bigger, even the ones that are very successful. And, and that really put him in a good position to be influential on, on big ideas like climate change. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 again, on an issue basis, but with ramifications that go well beyond it, I can think that, I can remember quite clearly when it was a, an understood trade-off in, in on environmental protection that either you had a clean environment or you had a healthy economy, and it right. was forced to choose. And it was either jobs or the environment. Jerry Brown has proven that that is not a trade-off that we have to make. Uh, right. Now, other people have helped contribute. I don't mean to say that he alone right. proved that. But California is a, uh, well, right now, California is struggling like everybody else. But California, over the past decade, has demonstrated conclusively that you can have vibrant, sometimes even explosive economic growth combined with rigorous environmental protection. That's a real lesson for the world. And that's, you know, again, once the, the particulars of this crisis begin to settle some, that's a guiding set of principles that really could uh, serve the world profoundly. Yeah, you know, lots of people talk about that possibility, but very few political leaders have shown that, that it's a possibility that we can actually accomplish that. And uh, that's a great legacy. It's a, it's a, hopefully, hopefully the future will pick up on it. And do the next time we talk to Jerry Brown, I want you to tell him that that's his legacy. Okay, so I will. You can I'll tell him you told me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, and so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Really appreciate your coming and sharing uh, your insights into Governor Jerry Brown with us. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for doing it.